Brian David Lynch at the Gilpin Street Holistic Center in Denver, Colorado, uh, on April the 25th, 1998. Uh, America and Identity, an exploration and discussion of how destiny necessity operates in relation to freedom identity in our own current landscape. We will begin with Walt Whitman and then 1776 American Foundation Stone in order to review the working challenge of corporations, media, and money. Brian David uh, wishes to contribute an outline of considerations which may be opened up to group discussion. Brian Lynch has, a, has been a public school teacher and co-founded Atlanta Georgia Waldorf School uh, the Children's Garden. He's involved in independent consulting and writing through serious research. And here he is. Um, yeah, I, I want to develop uh, a picture of law, politics, and economics in our current state of affairs and how we got into the condition our condition is in uh, to, to give a type of interpretation or overview in, in that context. Uh, I, I would like to get to the point of presenting a resurrection elevation uh, consideration or meditation, and I'm not sure if I can get to that from here, how, how much of that we'll be able to tackle, but uh, bear with me. I'd like to open with a poem by Stephen Vincent Benet. There are certain words our own and others were used to, words we've used, heard, had to recite, forgotten. Rubbed shiny in the pocket, left home for keepsakes. Inherited, stuck away in the back drawer. The locked trunk at the back of the quiet mind. Liberty, equality, fraternity. To none will we sell, refuse, or deny right or justice. We hold these truths to be self-evident. I am merely saying, what if these words pass? What if they pass and are gone and are no more? It took a long time to buy these words. It took a long time to buy them in much pain. Not long ago, a friend from Washington, D.C. sent me an article, a feature article from a Sunday edition of the Washington Post, and it was on the millennium impending as it is, and they had the worst, the best book of the millennium, The Worst Mistake, and other predictable categories uh, fleshed out, and, but the frontispiece, the feature for the whole article was The Man of the Millennium, and I would give you pause to reflect before I tell you that it was Genghis Khan sign of the times that we live in. And of course they were doing it purposely as uh, a devil's advocate, provocateur, human interest quirk to, to get your interest. Uh, but truly, we would have to recognize that for sheer impact value, he probably takes the banana for a thousand years. Uh, <coughs> He overturned half of the known world at the time and was going for the other half and might have even made it under particular circumstances. I uh, heard that there was a country group called Tractors and in their new CD, Farmers in a Changing World, their opening lyrics for the first song are, Now I lay me down to sleep, I'm afraid, dear Lord, I'm in too deep. And we're, we're definitely in it, and very deeply. I, I, 
got so interested in the Genghis Khan article that I read a couple of biographies, uh, and I was wondering what it means, where to put it, how it works, that, that type of a thing. And the context I, I used ultimately was the, the planetary evolutional scale of the Earth, where the first half of the Earth evolution is Mars, and the second half is Mercury in, in an esoteric modeling as worked with by Rudolf Steiner. Uh, and in the planetary scale, the astral scale of planetary evolution for the days of the week, uh, there is no Earth implicit because the Earth is represented by Mars slash Mercury. Uh, and Mars is how you drive in to get into full-fledged incarnation to take spirit and sock it right directly into matter. And the Mercury is a kind of chaotization movement which is connected ultimately with elevation in regard to the arcing descent and the arcing ascent of spirit into matter and matter elevated into spirit. Uh, and, and the Mars has to operate in such a fashion that the persona and the individuality can be fully integrated and cohered. Uh, solid stuff, true grit. And in the process, there's a lot of drum beating and driving up over the hill. Uh, and the Genghis Khan represents probably the most vivid picture of the Mars forces gone way too far. Uh, and it's left an incredible impact and legacy which surrounds us in many, many ways that we might not suspect today. Uh, just, just briefly, as some life characteristics, when he was born to a tribal chieftain of the northern Gobi tribal Mongol warriors, uh, he had a sizable clot of blood clenched in his infant fist as he was born. And even his father considered that a significant omen. When he was approximately nine or ten years of age, he justifiably killed his half-brother for stealing one of his fish. He was justifiable under Mongol tribal uh, law at that time. That, that's the end of the 12th century uh, and the, the period where he received his title at a tribal council was 1206. That's when the show got on the road. Uh, and at 13 years of age, his father was poisoned at a trick meeting of tribal leaders, and uh, Genghis Khan went underground on a uh, fugitive circuit from 13 until 18, 17 or 18. Uh, he was hidden in barns and put under food loads and wagons, transported from one place to another, and uh, on his initial escape, he pulled the classic trick of lying in a swamp with uh, reed, breathing through the reed for probably half a day or so to escape the initial attention. All of the northern tribal leaders wanted to get him as heir successor out of the picture. So it's an interesting way to spend that developmental period, needless to say. Um, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer makes uh, a number of comments about the legacy he left, which is uh, specifically evident in our modern system of taxation and the organization of the military. Uh, Genghis Khan was the first one to organize the military on a decimal system of structure and 
grouping. Uh, and another thing that's quite fascinating is that they were pioneers in the technique of artificial insemination in regard to animal breeding. And Pfeiffer indicates that that was exoterically, esoterically, they bred a race of human beings using artificial insemination. Uh, and I was quite amazed when a friend of mine loaned me a book on uh, having to do with uh, the history of Mongolia. And it showed a picture. Uh, it's uh, at the turn of the century of a <coughs> Mongol given by the Mongol emperor to the Tsar of Russia as a gift. And the fellow is uh, a little over nine feet high, and he stands next to a Russian, so, uh, Russian fellow, six feet high, and it looks a little bit like a kindergartner next to his older brother. Uh, and the interesting thing is, underneath it, it says, that this is typical of certain Mongols from an area of, from the area of the western provinces, indicating that it's not just an incident, but there's uh, groups and families of them. Uh, and this tends to corroborate what Pfeiffer suggested as far as experimenting uh, with the human race. Um, The Steiner says that uh, Genghis Khan was initiated personally by the backward fallen spirit of Atlantis. And the interesting thing is in uh, his Scorched Earth policy, which he institutionalized and pioneered, he uh, generally no one lived except artists and magicians and priests. The, those groupings of people he brought in and assimilated into the Mongol tribal system and used. And when he was in 1206, there was a convergence of northern tribal chieftains, and he had built everything up in the Gobi Desert. Uh, and he was acclaimed the leader of Northern Asia. And a shaman magician who was present at the meeting stood up and pointed his finger and said, you are Genghis Ka Khan, and gave him the name, the title, which means you are the emperor of all human people, the magnificent warrior, uh, and it stuck. And the, the interesting thing, too, is that in the accounts of Marco Polo with Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, uh, Marco Polo is very impressed by the fact that he had an open-door policy, uh, a little bit akin to the Mandarin Chinese, where he said, everyone's welcome, come and visit and show me your stuff, lay it out. Let's see what you've got. How good are you? And of course, the Christian missionary priests came thinking, boy, we, can, we, we really had a chance to make a mark. Uh, and they'd talk theology and have food and drink. And then he'd say, OK, now do something. And they go, what do you mean? And he said, well, you talk about the school of miracles, your, your teacher of miracles. What can you do? And they mumbled, well, we, we can't. That's not really the point. And uh, it, it's oftentimes been considered imaginative anecdote, but Polo says that Kublai Khan pours water and turns it into wine. And it indicates that there was a practical school of magical arts built in from the beginning to the Mongol development and Khanate rulership. And then, of course, he would kick them out afterward. He'd say, you guys are no good. You know, you talk good talk and you can't deliver. You're, 
and then he'd uh, not give them a place to stay and pick them up and have to scramble and wander back just when they thought they were going to make a big impression. Uh, the implication is that in the civilian life, the forces of the old moon, the ancient moon, ruled the Mongolians, and in the uh, military process, it was completely Mars. The uh, Kublai Khan was the one who established the Mongol dynasty. It didn't last too long but in China, but it's interesting because it, it was such a rough ride for China. They were just beginning to branch out into a delicate colonialism, spreading out, reaching out. And after the Mongols got done, they never went out again. They, they hid behind the door. It was a strict policy for almost a millennium of isolationism. The world comes to China, China does not go to the world. And that was a direct legacy of uh, Genghis Khan, who, who took it through China and up into the uh, almost the Tibet area. Um, and when Kublai Khan died, uh, the Mongol troops had just, an infantry troop had just entered Austria. And he died and they had to recall everyone. They had a terrific uh, highway system, uh, a very sophisticated highway system, which was, of course, the trump card functionally in holding the Roman Empire together. Uh, the taxes and the, the highway equals taxes. And those two run the muscle for the empire process. And uh, they, they had the, the, one of the highest positions in their society was courier, messenger. And they actually learned how to ride at full gallop sleeping on a horse on the highway. The, the horse knew the, was trained for the route. Uh, we used it on the stagecoach circuit, some of the same principles. And they would put raw meat under the saddle, and by the time they get done with half the ride, it would be thoroughly salted, heated, and tenderized, uh, which is the origin of steak tartare. Uh, they, and they, they sent messengers out. They brought everyone back in, regrouped them, uh, which, in essence, saved Europe, so to speak. But the Mongols left a black rose at the doorstep of Europe, which was the plague. They were the ones who brought it in from the Orient. And where the Mongols left off, the plague took up. And the plague decimated a third of the European population. But the interesting thing was that It, the labor became very valuable, and it broke the back of the feudal system. And that laid the pathway for beginning capitalism. So it, there, there's an interesting thread to modern transition. And furthermore, uh, Genghis Khan established a medieval free trade zone which had never happened before, a medieval gap. Uh, the block between the East and the West connecting in the Eurasian consideration was the Islamic Empire. It was huge. And it was, there was no way to get through it or around it. And Genghis Khan flattened it like a pancake. He left where great cosmopolitan cities used to be pyramids of human skulls and nothing else left. Uh, he eliminated the Islamic Empire, connected the East and West, and did it in a kind of free trade zone, which was very exciting for mercenaries and merchants and various classes of people. It was a whole new ball game. And that was any, anything that furthered that, he would uh, terrifically encourage and, and put his weight behind. 
and, and the interesting thing is that it was created by wholesale destruction of culture. That, that was, it, it went from the 12th, uh, the, the 13th century through the 14th century. It was over a period of time, but he started it. Uh, he, he pretty much got it underway, and then his four sons and the relevant grandsons carried it further. Uh, but it, as far as I know, I, I don't think they got any further. They, they started in Hungary and they got to Austria. Uh, they, they made further inroads into Hungary and Austria and then they pulled. Yeah, the, the, yeah, no, no, Genghis Khan didn't take it that far. Right. And that was critical to the Russian cohesion. And, and it's interesting because it, this, this free trade was established by the wholesale destruction of cultures and not turning back. And in a certain sense, the Nazis and the fascists pioneered a free trade zone policy in which industry, technology, and economy defined culture. And at the time, it was very distasteful to most of the rest of the world. It's been repackaged now, and it's the cat's pajamas. Everybody loves it. And nobody is, the benefits are so great for so many classes of entrepreneurs that nobody pays attention to the fact that it is still done at the wholesale destruction or redefinition of culture in which industry, technology, and economy are allowed to define culture. And in regard to Russia, the uh, Prokofiev, does a, a fantastic synopti synopsis uh, of Russian history, and he basically demonstrates that for uh, s several hundred years, the, the Mongols laid waste to village after village, uh, going into Russia on a, on a terrific level, and by the time they got kicked out, they had intermarried into the aristocracy nobility and put the, put the uh, program chip and software in, as it were. And the legacy is Bolshevism, communism, both in China and Russia. Uh, it's interesting that Rudolf Steiner said that Bolshevism was a concentrated seraphic seed uh, this militant economic unification principle. Uh, and looking further, we come to trying to consider what is money really? How does it work? Why is it? Uh, and the origin of money is functionally in a loan. Someone makes a loan, barter, trade, borrow, but functionally a loan. Uh, and in essence, that should or does demonstrate trust. And money is essentially a system of trust. Uh, and you, we could all suspect that insofar as we lose trust, or there is no basis of trust in our exchange, the money is essentially worthless. The job of a central bank is to maintain scarcity of money for the integrity of value. And necessarily, you're, you're completely in a system of competition, aggression, and scarcity of resources in following that path. The the, the money is only an asset to you if it's a liability to the bank. And conversely, 
It is an asset to the bank if it's a liability to you. That's how central banking operates. And it's easy to understand that that free trade at the expense of culture formalized in the Western Hemisphere through central banking carries this impulse forward, the, the competition aggression uh, and we're, we're working with, with that legacy very, very intimately right now. Uh, in the early 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville, at the time of the revolution in France, studied the American prison system for France. And he saw a new kind of slavery coming out of radical individualism in the brave new world of the United States. And this was right off the starting blocks. This is what he says, I seek to trace the novel features under which despotism may appear in the world. The first thing that strikes the observation is an innumerable multitude of humanity, all equal and alike, <coughs> incessantly endeavoring to procure the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. Each of them living apart as a stranger to the fate of all the rest. His children and his private friends constitute to him the whole of humankind. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, he is approximate to them, but he does not see them. He touches them, but he does not feel them. He exists only in himself and for himself alone, and if his kindred still remain to him, he may be said at any rate to have lost his country. Above this race of humanity stands an immense and tutelary power which takes upon itself alone to secure their gratifications and to watch over their gratified fate. That power is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It would be like the authority of a parent if, like that authority, its object was to prepare humans for humankind and manhood and brotherhood, but it seeks, on the contrary, to keep them in perpetual childhood. It is well content that the people should rejoice, provided they think of nothing but rejoicing. <coughs> Devastating commentary. Uh, right, right off the starting blocks. And de Tocqueville was the one who said, at that same time, he said, when tyranny comes to America, it will come through the back door. It will come silently like the somnolence of a sleeping animal. Uh, now, we jump over in, into the, more or less, the present century stage, shifting over from last century, and Rudolf Steiner produced maps in his day from last century which showed the geopolitical power configurations of the 20th century globally, global maps, uh, that didn't exist then. There was no sense to them at the time. And he said, these will make sense, and these guys are serious, and they won't go away. Uh, and the difficulty so far, <coughs> every, everyone and their relatives can figure out there's something rotten in Denmark and all is not well and we, we uh, uh, there, there's various conspiracy theory abounding, it's uh, now popular movie themes, uh, there's just... Uh, Mel Gibson put out a conspiracy theory, and then there was another one. Enemies of the State just came out. Uh, it's hitting a, a popular venue. It's come out from a subculture, under the rose type of a thing. Uh, but it's hard to tell what the overview is, what, what the basic patterns are. And the easiest way to begin from the Anglophile Lodge agenda, which is what Steiner suggests, is John Ruskin 
and Ruskin was a Oxford trained university professor and in the second half of his life he was dedicated to renewing the British aristocracy and extending that influence globally and it's very interesting because I, the name sounded very familiar and I was trying to get a bead on it uh, and I was in the uh, coach's office at Shining Mountain Waldorf School two days ago and there was a stack of books <coughs> by the side of his desk that someone had left and I flipped a small thin volume a Dover book over and it was John Ruskin The King of the Golden River which is a classic fairy tale uh, good, evil, gnomes, dwarves, the, the black brothers uh, it, it's a classic European style fairy tale with uh, nature spirits there's uh, definitely demonstrates uh, an occult background and understanding. Uh, and in the jacket of the book, he's described as a utopian idealist and a nature lover. Ruskin's uh, student was Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes uh, was a very influential figure in United Kingdom and Britain, and his goal was to establish a secret society modeled on the Jesuits and the Freemasons to take this plan and plug it in, rebuild the English aristocracy on a new, improved, lemon-scented, better level, and cover the world with it like Sherman Williams' paint, to found a holy empire. But the interesting thing is he imagined that it was possible to have in this process Washington, D.C. as a capital city, which is a telling and prophetic notation. Uh, and he said, in the end, Britain is to establish a power so overwhelming that war must cease and the millennium be realized. That's it in a nutshell. Alfred Lord Milner, a protege of Cecil Rhodes. This is where the Rhodes Scholarship comes from, and that's what that money is to further. The recipients of Rhodes Scholarships are to carry that game plan, plan forward, uh, even though the furniture has been rearranged, and it is now America, the, the United States, that will do it, but with the parental core backing and organization of Britain, but the American materialistic economy format will, will actually accomplish the, this. Uh, th this, change, this change was made with Averill Harriman, the new American policy which uh, preempted the, the British flying wedge. Alfred Lord Miller, Miller was Johnny on the spot for, Brit for British interests in South Africa. And he took a following of students back with him who became known as Milner's Kindergarten, Milner's Protégés. They established uh, an organization called the Round Table, uh, which is interesting to consider. Uh, where that comes from. And he was aligned with imperial idealists. And at the same time, you've got to remember that there's Gladstone pushing a kind of humanitarian statecraft, but he's, he loses out to Disraeli, Rosebery, Rhodes. Uh, there, uh, there, there's a kind of hyper-nationalism that they're peddling, and it's very easy to get with, and most of the people follow that direction. Uh, the, and out of the round table, on a modern level, we have the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. From Chatham House, a sister organization in the States was developed called the, the Council on Foreign Relations a backup organization to the Council on Foreign Relations becomes the Trilateral Commission. They're all dedicated to the, to the same globalism. 
Uh, and uh, the, the interesting thing, too, is that uh, Alfred Lord Milner uh, was the one who started the Boer War. And that's a, that's a very interesting thing. It, the Boer War was used as a model for the Russian Revolution. Uh, in many different ways, and concentrate the word concentration camp came out of the Boer War. It was uh, a modern institution as a legacy of the of the Boer War. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, when you when you start tracking it, it's the CFR, the Trilateral Commission, and these related groups, which you can see on the paper, are considered colonial governorships for the overseer of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Rothschilds. And that's, that's the key to the money picture, is always the Rothschilds. Uh, Steiner said this, there was truly an impulse of evil connected with what they formulated and formalized over a period of time. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. The, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, is had all of the predominating trustees, the, the majority grouping of trustees for the Brookings Institute, the Rand Institute, the Hudson Institute, the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, Mideast Institute, are all CFR members. In the 70s and 80s, most of the major people in the media news uh, configuration are, became members of the CFR. Uh, Barbara Walters, Tom Brokaw, Dan Rathers, they're all CFR members. I, I think it, as far as they're concerned, yeah, Bill Clinton, needless to say, uh, for many of them, especially in the media, they, they, there was a drive for media membership in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and I suspect that many of those people are not intrinsically interested or historically aware of any of the real background. For It's another trophy for the shelf. It's another honorary membership. It's the in-club and that type of a thing. Uh, the interesting thing is, as Steiner suggested, first of all, uh, a lot of people are not aware of the agenda, they just carry it out, and the agenda is carried out uh, in modern circumstances not through aggression directly, but through uh, inference, influence peddling, suggestion. We're, we've arrived at a time where if we do not have a world picture or an image of the human being, we are entering into a new class of handicapped human being. Uh, because if we don't have one, it will be supplied for us, whether it's explicit or implicit or explicit. You know, it, it's, it will be supplied for us. Uh, and the, the thing is that uh, very few people involved in the process are working on a level of consciousness soul operation. Uh, but the, the thing that I want to emphasize is that you can go back, you, you can find statements by heads of the Federal Reserve System, by presidents, by major statesmen, by heads of banks that lay it all out in the line. It's not hidden. It's just that it doesn't exist in daily affairs or in the media. It, it will not be reported per se. But all of the evidence is totally available to pick up and, and put together. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, 
a lot of the literature which has good material in it is has a lot of invective and rhetoric and drum beating. Uh, and consequently, it becomes very easy when someone brings this up, any of these types of issues, to say, oh, well, they're pro-patriot, sovereign, fanatic, uh, gun, gun buffs. Uh, so, so it becomes easy to invalidate. But the granddaddy of all of this research on the American front was Ezra Pound. He's the one who undish covered the riddle. He lifted the rock up uh, half, halfway through his career as one of the, acknowledged as globally as one of the most preeminent literary artists of the 20th century, uh, conversant in 18 languages and 200 dialects. Uh, a lot of people in, consider the last half or third of his life typical of a guy who's too smart for his own britches and uh, grudging, eccentric kind of fellow. Uh, but he started a, a radio show that was, in essence, the prototype of all things considered. A little music, a little culture, a little poetry, some news, and some commentary. Uh, and he had a, a summer home in Italy, Italy, and nobody would let him do it anywhere, and so he exercised his Italian citizenship option, and the fascists let him go on radio. They didn't know what he was doing. They were very confused by what he was talking about. Uh, in university arenas, it's considered a pro-fascist stunt in bad taste, which it definitely wasn't. But he said, folks, the, these national leaders had their fingers in the international pie big time. And that's where the frontier is. That's where there's no rules. That's where the money is. And that's where their heart is. And they'll play the mom apple pie 4th of July on the left hand of the piano while they play the internationalist circuit with the right hand. Uh, and he said, don't get lost on the nationalism issues. Follow the internationalism. Follow where the money is. And you get a completely different story. And he came home voluntarily, and he was put immediately in St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital overlooking Washington, D.C., for 13 years without a trial, on treason, without a lawyer. And finally, the only reason he didn't get a lobotomy and electroshock was because uh, there were too many famous people visiting him from all over the world. And he went, Robert Frost finally led a group of artists to open a congressional subcommittee hearing on what the hell was this guy doing there. And they immediately spit him out the back door and said, uh, nothing, sorry. Uh, you, no, it was early 50s. Yeah, McCarthy time. And uh, Ezra Pound said, I, I've reached, I, I can do no more original in the literary arts. And he began studying international law, politics, and economy. As a result of which, Fifteen years' worth of research resulted in a collaboration between George Stimson, head of the Washington Press Club, and one of the heads of the Library of Congress, Eustace Mullins, and Ezra Pound, while he was institutionalized. And the book was called The Secrets of the Federal Reserve. And it's the granddaddy of all the books that can open stuff. And it's, it's totally solid. There's no holes in it. Um, and uh, very, a lot of people use the derivative material without paying homage or, or knowing from whence it comes. Uh, it, yeah, it's still in print. It's been reprinted. Uh, I, I've got a list that I can give you. The, uh, the Secrets of the Federal Reserve, The uh, World Rulers by Eustace Mullins, uh, David Icke, and The Truth Shall Set You Free, and the two books by Temple Lodge Press, uh, Amnon Roveni and Terry M. Boardman. If, 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 if you get those five books, you can read all the road signs on the modern horizon. It, it's completely evident what, what the basic patterns are. You, you can skip all of the artifact. Um, Dr. Carol Quigley, 
very interesting fellow, uh, Professor Emeritus at Georgetown University, the, the grandmother of all Jesuit universities, the hotbed, uh, Dr. Carol Quigley, eminent, impeccable reputation, uh, Bill Clinton's teacher at Georgetown, says the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, New York City, is the American branch of a society which originated in England and believes in national directives that should be obliterated and one world rule established. I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted in the 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. He published a book called uh, Tragedy and Hope, which is a review of 20th century Western history. It's a doorstopper. It's uh, 1,500, 1,800 pages. It's not for the weak-hearted. Uh, it's not fun. It's not popular. Uh, but as a result, Gary Allen in the 60s did a quickie popular synopsis of it called None Dare Call It Conspiracy. And that, that was... I think it was one dare call it conspiracy. The, maybe it was treason, but uh, that, that's sort of the whole latter-day popular conspiracy bandwagon rolling. Uh, but Carol Quigley is is very clear and very direct. He he's a member of all of these groups. He's the first one on a bona fide level.